Hello friends, you are watching EDC English Literature. I am Ardhendu De. Today, we are going to read the timeline of English literature from Old English period. That is uh, from pre-Beulf up to 1300. Many a student comes to me and asks me how to read history of English literature. In fact, you cannot have the full circle of understanding and age unless you comprehend the works of literature in the context of important historical, social and cultural events. So whenever we start reading history of Old English literature, what comes first? The Old English how the, it becomes the old English. The language formation comes the first. So the birth of English language or understanding how the English language has been given birth is the very first criteria that you should understand. So the birth of English language first. The birth of English language when you are talking about birth of English, it happens in several stages. The tribal Germanic peoples from Northwest Germany, uh, you know probably the Saxons and Angles, and from Jutland, Jutes, invaded Eastern England around 5th century AD, and the language spoken by them became the origin of English because as they became the winner, their language also get the prominence. In stage 2, what happens? Their old English or what we have just learned, Anglo-Saxon language, survived and evolved until the Normandy conquered the island in 1066, which is popularly known as Norman conquest of England. It greatly influenced the evolution of the language because for about 300 years thereafter, the Normans used Anglo-Norman, which was close to Old French rather than Old English as the language of the court, law and administration. So the French influence gradually pops up. In the third stage, uh, the latter part of the 14th century onwards, the English had replaced the French as the language of law and government. but there remain considerable influence of French influence or the Anglo-Norman borrowings that continued and, and, and the development of the language continued. So uh, by the hands of uh, by the hands of Chaucer, it get the maturity in its modern form. But there are many tales in between those stories. Now uh, you can have the birth of English language and how it how it evolved and evoluted uh, you can have that post in my another lecture you can just pop up there and try to understand a bit now don't get confused about the volume at the and the intricacies of the old english i will retell the story of the old english people defining the works of literature in the context of important historical social and cultural events First, uh, what are the sources of Old English people and literature? Uh, we are reading Old English people and the literature. Now, what are the manuscripts that, uh, first of all, we have to understand? Where from it was find out? In fact, the manuscripts of Old English poetry are four in number, and, and they are Buell MS, it is called, and those um, manuscripts were named after. The location where it was found popularly it is called Buell PMS, Junius MS. Uh, Junius uh, in that section you can have Catmon and the exterior book uh, and fourth notably Varsali book uh, that contains Sino poems. Now as the Anglo-Saxon people, Jude, Saxon and Anglic people were trying to gain the authority of the new land and intermingling with the new race. 
different historical ha happenings also occurring that make the shapes of the English. 597 is the landing of Augustine and his monks. So the conversion of the Christianity, Christianity started at that period. The most significant landmark in Anglo-Saxon history is the people of the so-called savage people or uh, the non-Christian people turning into Christianity. Augustine's mission started in 597 and whole of the England, not whole of the England, but maximum of the England was converted to uh, English, uh, converted to Christianity by the end of uh, 600 or 600 train. Among the kings, so many of the kings that are, that are embattling, but England or the location of the England had been their birthplace and they are the king of the England solely. That motivation started with uh, Alfred, you know, uh, the name of the king is popular not only for ruling his countrymen, but also for his literary contributions. 867 to 900 odd is the ruling of king of Wessex is popularly called Alfred. Um, he was the king of the West Saxons and son of Ithalfolk. He subsides the Danish invasion and installs a peaceful civil government. So the first, first hand stability of the location or uh, the region has been established by Alfred King. He favored scholars and the intellectual resources. His active desire for learning uh, also begets a handful of literary assets that by which we are presently reading the old English people. As a writer and translator, either he translated all those texts or rather commissioned to get translated of all those texts from Latin into English or Old English. Notably, the handbook, a collection of extracts of religious subjects and that was uh, commissioned by him. Cura Pastoralis or uh, the Herdsman's Book of Gregory, uh, the Great, with a preface by himself. It is a kind of fast English prose that we can find out. So that is very important in respect of uh, development of language and prose writing particularly. British ecclesiastical history of the English people was being translated by him too. So his writings and contributions is notably noteworthy. But one epoch-making work is the Anglo-Saxon Chronicles, which already he brought up to 855. So this kind of up-to-date historical annals is probably written or compiled by his own hand. Uh, the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, popularly known, it is known as Anglo-Saxon Chronicle. It highlights the kings and their ruling and their job duties is there, but historical important things or happenings has been recorded. So we learn many a history of the old English people and kings and their ha habitats and their lifestyles through these chronicles. Uh, both his philosophy are also being translated by him. Some of these sums were translated by him. So many of the translations works that he commissioned or he done by his uh, own hand uh, is uh, handy to understand the English people. He also compiled a law book and that law book uh, exhibits the then time uh, social panorama of the people. For his literary contribution, particularly of prose, he is given the title the father of English prose. So we can take Alfred both as a king as, and as a literary contributor. Another character that we find reference is Alfred, but the historical authenticity of that person is quite disputed. But by his name, the book of Homilis, 
uh, a kind of grammar grocery and a kind of uh, religious translation of the sufferings of the saints and part of biblical translations are there also in his name these books are important for the study of doctrine and practice of the earlier christian they are the earlier church in england they are also important in to uh, developing english prose writing so both alfred king alfred and alfric is for prose studies important latin writer bede has been in 6732735 in that time it is important while understanding old english people because most of the religious writings and the ethical writing as well as law writing were being from bede though it was written in original latin text but his work his works is being translated by alfred the king We have already known that Old English people contained a beautiful poem, Beul. It was written 700 odd, and the story of Beul uh, belongs to a pagan origin. It comes to the extent that he he came in to help Dan's Hodgar, King Hodgar. After a prolonged battle, he kills the monster Grendel and Grendel's mother. and his victory is being celebrated so beul is a original king historical king or not that is quite debatable but it is quite a pagan tale rather christian elements were interfused in later part about 750 we can have sinewul another great the great poet in reference this anglo saxon poet a northumbrian or a marsian quite not certain his literary outputs are contained in extra books and the versali books uh, extra and versali books are the containing places where from these manuscripts were rescued his earlier poems enjoy a joyous and poetic nature rejoicing the beauty of this world his other poems are quite philosophical and meditative and christian elements are there few of the poems are signed by him and few of the poems do not contain his signature scholars has devised his poems by his signature writing the signed poems that are the juliana is one of the beautiful poem the legend of virgin mater it indicates a transition uh, of his spiritual life sinewul spiritual life and sorrow and repentance is also predominant notes in this kind of religious text where devotional journey of sinewul the poet is being stated here the christ uh, another poem the beautiful text of this poem it tells that it has passed through the clouds to an assured faith and peace so his journey from uh, clouds of doubts towards faith and peace has been stated here the fates of the apostles and elin uh, is also on christian theme uh, on sacrifice and the legend of saint helena there are few unsigned poems that albert in his book has stated the phonics the second part of the gathlak the andreas and the dream of the root these are not signed the authorship is controversial but technically it is taken as sinewul poetry and in this poetry we can have beauty of the christian elements in this poem by 990 uh, we are having some of the battle poems there is two great war poems that i like to refer here you must uh, read a part of it or uh, the theme of it the battle of runanburg uh, 
is based on a true war fought between the Saxons and the Scots in which the Saxons were victorious. So it's a joyous reference to their lifestyle. The Battle of Maldon has for its theme the battle which took place in 993 in which the old chief of the East Saxons met his death and the poem ends in sorrow. So it's a elegiac note we can find out. In many of the and elegiac poems, we can find out a kind of a, a particular feature called caning. When you are going through Old English poetry, you must know what the caning is. Caning means a picture compounds that are being used by Old English poets. They have a metaphorical quality. In modern terms, you term it as euphemism or periphrasis. For example, the term, well paths indicate the oceans. Wave rider is for boat and ship. Uh, ring giver, hawk friend, uh, or the friend to the king. Simply all these words are joint vocabulary. The usage is to arrest, uh, evoke it uh, on the subject as the writer conceived it. So the kennings often indicate a kind of a compound words with a load of meaning. It states a kind of a noun that indicates it, an identifying one. For example, a king who is given the object support or treasure to his supporters. This is the role the author indicates a king should fulfill. Uh, through the Old English use of kennings, the idea that uh, the word represents some load of meaning become the word itself. In addition, uh, because of their uh, syllabic nature, it allowed multisyllabic nature. In fact, the poet has the liberty to structure his parts in suitable rhyming pattern because most of the Old English texts are uh, non-alliterative, but this kind of word compounds make a musical essence in the poem. Sometimes these picturesque words or kennings become metaphorical, sometimes symbolical. Uh, to understand a particular kenning, you can have the whole text into its meaning otherwise it is quite difficult but you must know that caning is a kind of a compound words that carry a load of meaning with musicality not to get burden of technicality i am now going to share a few master read anglo-saxon love poems the wife's lament or the wife's complaint is an old english poem only surviving 53 lines. It is found in Exeter books that I have already mentioned. Generally treated as a, an elegy in the manner of Germanic women's song, a kind of feminist voice. It has more personal tone. It is of a woman who has falsely accused and banished from her husband's home. And in this lamentation song, women complains of that sort of thing. So it's a kind of personal attachment and personal tone that adds to our mind. And it is very excuse guide reading. You must go this translation from Old English poem. It will interest you much. The another notable love poem of this uh, Old English period is Husband's Message or popularly alternatively it is called The Lover's Message. Uh, the Old English lyrics that are being preserved in Exeter book, it is one of the few surviving love lyrics of the Anglo-Saxon period. Notably, the husband delivers his message on a wooden piece and he afloats it on sea and that wooden piece reads his uh, unpretentious and sincere feelings. 
it is remarkable for its um, ingenious kind of exhibition and its emotive power uh, it tells in simple way how much he is in love with his wife so it's a counter of that um, wife's complaint among the anglo saxon elegiac poems dior's lament or the lament of the dior about late 10th century it's a collection that we find in exeter book this kind of poem elegiac because it tells about some sorry aspects of life the poem is consisting of the reflection and misfortune by the poem the poem is usually thought to name doar the poem has no title in the exeter books and a, and the scholars have given its modern title uh, by different editors the dior's lord has replaced him with another poet and dior here mentions various figures from germanic traditions and reconciles his own troubles with the troubles that he has faced so here dior's complaint is complaining to his master that despite of his no idor he has given the burden of uh, just removing him and replacing it a rival poet so here dior's lament is quite that of as experience on it the most beautiful and notable lines that it contains it again and again says with the line the refrain that passed away so many of this so dior's lament says that he he will bypass those sorry aspects of his life in no time in time reference 13th century is very productive lajamon's brut is one of the best and exquisite example of british history you know that anglo saxon chronicles that has been compiled by alfred again this lajamon is the second chronicle i must say the chronicle of britain even though it is in the middle period of uh, middle english epist lejamon has compiled this more than 15000 lines are there and it simply narrates the history of britain since the anglo saxon chronicles this is the historiography written uh, for the first time lejamon's brood popularizes a kind of arthurian legend in english here you can have that collection of stories and the rhyming pattern is alliterative with assonance so it is quite interesting reading as well as important reading as far as a student of literature is concerned in 1215 we can have orms ormula has been written by orm by the very title you can understand that uh, it is written by orm the monk it is consisting 20000 lines and it is early middle english verse though i am mentioning those middle english verses in this section only because this is the crossing lines where from old english to mid to middle english there is a transition because of this kind of uh, phonemic orthography adopted by this author the work preserves many details of english pronunciations existing at that time when the language was in normandy influence consequently it is more playable things in terms of philology in terms of historical linguistic tracing of that development of the language i must mention another short lyric uh, it is written about 1220 the owl and the night angel even though you, one can term it in the middle english one can still read it at old english Uh, it's uh, detailing about a kind of a debate between an owl and a night angel you know owl uh, and the night angel 
the debate is over by, is overheard by poems poems narrator the owl represents pedantic pedantic philosophy and the night angle romantic philosophy this kind of earliest example of a uh, literary form known as debate poetry um, get very much familiar in letter poetry and it has been used in several of the writing styles there had been a great historical happening in 1215 that is magna carta was signed by john king it is historically important because it is the first charter of rights and that has been submitted before the king and it can be told that it is the first step to the democratic process of england so magna carta the latin name which means great charter of freedom is commonly that commonly known as great charter or magna carta is the royal charter of rights agreed by john the king this draft originally gives some kind of democratic rights and it leads towards democracy or restricted things you know world between barons kings and that of simple public has been resolved the church rights has been uh, given a, a legal establishment by which the power was set so this is the very beginning of the democracy process or democratic process in england even though it started a new thing in 14th century 1337 the 100 years war with france started i must conclude this old english discussion with the start of the 100 years war with france that begins in the reign of king edward 3 the 100 years war most significant conflict in the middle ages it continued more than 115 years even though there had been several occasions when peace was restored or tried to restore but these rival dynasties fought for the thrones of the largest kingdom in east western europe the war's effect on european history was lasting both side produced innovations in military in technology in tactics so um, for for what tactics and Uh, for innovative idea ideas and ideologies this war begets a kind of revolution in our history but it also made a lasting enmity between france and england and this conflict was not settled casting john wycliffe as a translator of bible in english Uh, this middle english writer has been popular for his translation of bible and he also wrote some original contributions in latin in 14th century this scholastic philosopher this english scholastic philosopher and biblical translator as well as theologian has been a priest reformer wycliffe's translation of bible that popularly known at once popularized the biblical theme the christianity and christianity reached to the layman the words and voices and the church reached to the layman by his process of translation work so wycliffe's reading or wycliffe's translation reading uh, can be handy in understanding the people of the then time so i think you have gone through all these old english periods and its important works important rulers important writers uh, while reading this you must understand that i have told in early points that you must have to understand the cultural the social as well as um, the very linguistic aspects of each and every writing and you must have to relate yourself your understanding with that of with that text otherwise it cannot or it, it will be very hard to memorize all those concepts dates and publications so like share comment and obviously subscribe to my channel to get this kind of post and if you have any doubts in old english poetry 
you can just ask me a question. I will try my best to give some answers to you. Thank you. Bye-bye.